it was nearly impossible to fall asleep. I would lay there with my eyes wide open and my imagination running wild. My heart seemed to be beating more and more rapidly as each moment passed by. Because tomorrow was Christmas. I, of course, would be the first one to wake up. And I would go wake my mother and my siblings far earlier than they wanted me to. And I would run to the living room. We would open gifts and we would have breakfast. And then we would go to grandma and grandpa's house. And I would play with cousins and we would play games and have another wonderful meal. It was Christmas. And I could hardly fall asleep the night before as I laid there and waited with joyous anticipation. Well, this morning we're going to hear from Jesus as he's teaching his disciples about waiting in anticipation. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 24. As you know, we've been moving through the Gospel of Luke, and now in this Advent season we're going to shift over to the Gospel of Matthew and hear some different readings uh, from Matthew's account of the Christ, and it will instruct us as we move through this Advent season. Today we'll be in Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. This is what the word of the Lord says to us this morning. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. So Jesus in this passage is talking to his disciples and he's warning them. Jesus is heeding his disciples about not being ready for his return. Jesus is instructing them to keep awake, as he says in verse 42, for they do not know the hour, the day on which their Lord will come. In verse 36 He says, no one knows, not the angels, nor the Son, nor the Father. This is an unknown time. And he says, it will happen as in the days of Noah. Meaning that just as everyone around Noah, as he says, was eating and drinking and giving giving in marriage, they had no idea about the flood coming. They were completely obtuse. They were unaware. So will it be with the coming of the Son of Man. Which, by the way, the Son of Man is a title for the Davidic king, the king who comes from the line of David. And so Jesus tells them these two short stories. He says, two will be in a field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and the other will be left. So, therefore, keep awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And then he tells them that if the owner had known on what Part of the night, his house was going to be broken into. He would have stayed awake all night long, watching and waiting. So be ready. Keep awake, Jesus instructs his disciples. And it is no wonder that Jesus felt the need to admonish them to keep awake because it would not, if they missed his return, it would not be the first time that Israel missed the coming of their Messiah. They did not recognize their Messiah the first time he came. They crucified him. They had been waiting in anticipation for someone to come to restore Israel, to rebuild the temple, to sit in the Davidic throne, and to put Rome in its place. But that wasn't the kind of Messiah 
that came. That's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus was, nor was it the kind of Messiah they were promised. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, as we hear about this person who will come and the sort of kingdom that they will usher in. In Isaiah chapter 2, 1 through 5, the prophet is writing to the people of Israel a time when they have no hope, and he, this is what we read. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. He's talking about the coming Messiah. And he says the, that the Lord's mountain will be raised higher than all mountains. And so what the nation of Israel was expecting was this throne that would be raised above all other thrones. And what mountain does Jesus uh, raise up above all other mountains? Mount Calvary. It wasn't the, the Messiah they were expecting. They wanted him to come and to reign politically and to help them to uh, liberate themselves uh, by force. Except that's not what they were promised. In verse 4, the Messiah shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. This is what the people will do. They will not have a revolt and free themselves. Instead, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They'll take their weapons and they'll take what formerly was an instrument of death and they will turn it into an instrument that helps to produce life. That's the kind of work that this Messiah will bring in. And neither shall they learn war anymore when this Messiah reigns. But they missed him when he came in a manger because it wasn't what they were expecting. So, in Matthew, Jesus is warning his disciples so they won't miss him again. Because the first time he came, they had such a different picture of a Messiah in mind that they did not recognize him. They slept through his coming. We sang this morning, O little town of Bethlehem, it says, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. That's Christ. And all around, everyone was asleep to what was happening that night. They didn't see that everlasting light because it wasn't what they were looking for. It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't what they expected. And so Isaiah the prophet instructed them to come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let's not sleep through the coming of the Messiah. Let's not be ignorant of who our Messiah is. And so my question this morning is, is it possible that we have fallen asleep? Would we recognize Jesus if he came to us in the flesh this morning? On the front of your bulletin, there's a picture that's probably familiar to a lot of you. It's a painting from 1940 by Warner Selman. It's called The Head of Christ. He did, also did the painting of Christ standing at the door knocking. That was also by Warner. And uh, it's a great picture that has meant a lot to a lot of people. But I'm wondering if perhaps, if that's what we're expecting, if we might be a little disappointed when Christ comes. Because the truth is, when Christ comes, he will not be white. He was not from America. He is not European. 
he will not be a white man. He probably won't have blue eyes. If you saw this picture in color, you'd see that he painted Jesus to have blue eyes. It's a lovely picture, great looking guy. But Jesus probably won't have blue eyes. And uh, a professor of mine recently pointed out to me that most men in that time and place were about five foot one. So I might just be taller than Jesus, which I'm not taller than most people, so that sounds like good news to me. (laughs) But maybe the picture of our Christ that we have is kind of a misconception. Maybe we wouldn't recognize Christ if he came to us this morning because he might be a little darker than we expect. He might be a little shorter than we expect. Perhaps we aren't awake to the Christ that we claim to love. And just as Jesus warned his disciples about the days of Noah when people were just marrying and eating and drinking and going about their business as everything was normal and had no idea of what was coming, perhaps that's us. Are these words true of us that Jesus speaks? You do not know when your Lord is coming. You do not know on what day your Lord is coming. You must be ready. In the book of Romans, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he gives them an important instruction in, verse, in uh, chapter 13 of the book of Romans. He writes to them, and this is what he says. You know what time it is. It is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Then let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not reveling in drunkenness and not in debauchery and listlessness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires." He's writing to them and he's giving this this instruction in verse 11. Now is the moment for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first became believers. Is that true of us that we are more aware now of our need for salvation than when we first came to know Christ? Do we realize now that God saves us? Uh, Are we more aware of the salvation we have received than when we first believed? When, when we baptize people in the Church of the Nazarene, as we did this past summer, one of the questions that we ask is, do you realize that God saves you now? Because we believe that salvation is a present thing. It's not something, it's not a card you get punched at one point and then you're good to go. It is a constant stream of the blood of Christ over our lives. Salvation is an every moment occurrence. I have a professor that loves to say, God saves you now. God is saving you now. Our salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. And if that's true, then let us put away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. We no longer are living in the night, but the day is near. And so we live in the light, just as the Isaiah the prophet instructed Israel to come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The night is gone, the day is near. Let us live as in the day, put on the the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is, how? How do we watch for Christ? How do we become ready? So that if Christ does come, we'll know who we're looking for. Which leads me to another question. What does Advent mean anyway? We say this is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. Well, what does that mean? Does it just mean that we hang some wreaths? have some greenery out, we light a candle. What does Advent mean anyway? Advent means coming. That's why we read this this morning, Greg, let us, in the reading, our Lord comes. Because Advent is all about the coming of Christ. Specifically, the coming of Christ in the event of the Incarnation, When God took on flesh and came to where we were. That's what Advent is all about. The coming of Christ in the flesh. And so I'm wondering if maybe we can start this practice of being ready 
of being ready, of watching, and becoming aware of when Christ is coming to us now, presently, so that we will know who Christ is. Maybe Christ is coming to us now as we wait for his return. So have we fallen asleep to Christ coming to us as we wait for his return? Is it possible that we have been sleeping through little incarnations all around us? This morning we sang a song called Holy Spirit, and one of the lines says, Let us become more aware of your presence. Oh, that that might be our prayer that we become more and more aware of the presence of our Savior in our lives. And as we become more and more aware of the presence of our Savior, we get to know who Christ is. We get to understand what Christ is like. We get to know His character. We get to know what pleases Him, what doesn't please Him. We get to know what kind of Messiah it is that we are expecting to come again in His fullness. And then one day when He does come in His fullness, we'll know who we're looking for because we have become so intimate with Him now. And I'm wondering what kind of people might we be if we began to walk in this light, if we began to walk in the light of Christ coming to us presently as we wait for his return. Perhaps, just like Paul says, when we become aware of how close our salvation is, how close our salvation is to us, how present it is, we begin to live differently. We no longer live in darkness. We're not reveling in drunkenness, debauchery, and litlessness, not quarreling and jealousy anymore. We're living in the day. We're putting on the Lord Christ. So perhaps the more we become aware of Christ's presence, we will live like Christ now because we're overwhelmed by the frequency with which our Lord reveals himself to us. Perhaps if we were really tuned in to the presence of Christ, we would be overwhelmed with how often it is Christ is making himself known to us. And then we begin to live differently. We don't participate in those things anymore. We're not living in the night, we're living in the day. And as Isaiah the prophet wrote, the things that in our life that were formerly used as weapons, as ways of bringing about death, they're transformed by Christ into tools of bringing life. So perhaps um, our weapons this morning are our words. You know just the right thing to say to that person to stab them in the back. Well, not with us anymore. Our words, our sighs, our glances, or maybe even our gestures are transformed and we beat them into plowshares and into pruning hooks. Those things in our life which were formerly used as weapons now are tools to bring about life. And so when we speak to each other, we're not speaking words that bring about death, but we speak to each other and speak blessing and speak words of life to one another because we're aware of how often Christ is revealing himself to us and our our sense of the the closeness of our God, the intimacy we have with our Savior begins to change us from the inside out. Do you know who Ebenezer Scrooge was? One of my favorite stories, A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge was transformed, but it was because of three visits from these three spirits. It was the coming close of that spirit and what the spirit revealed to him in each of those that transformed his life. Well, I think the same is true of us. If we became aware of how often the spirit came close to us, of how close our savior was, of how close our salvation was, how often the Lord is visiting us and revealing truth to us, then we might be transformed by that. So that when Christ comes We'll know exactly who it is we're looking for. We'll know what kind of Savior that is coming for us again. We won't be expecting like Israel was when Christ came. We won't be expecting a warrior king and then receive a suffering servant. We'll know what kind of Christ to expect. C.S. Lewis wrote, When we see the face of God, we shall know that we have always known it. When we see the face of God, we shall know that we have always known it. What he means there is that 
when we begin to get accustomed to the way that our Lord interacts with us, when we get to be aware of how the Lord uses someone else in our life to speak truth, when we finally see our Savior face to face, we will connect that to every moment that He has revealed to Himself to us. And we will know that is exactly the person that was speaking to me all along. No question about it. And so... Maybe this morning we need to hear this instruction to keep awake, to come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now is the time to wake from our sleep because our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first became believers. You might notice that our Christmas tree is bare. It's still pretty. It's still a pretty tree, but it's bare, and usually that's not the case, right? My Christmas tree at home has ornaments and lights on it. Well, as I began to think about Advent and this idea of waiting the coming of the Lord, and as I thought about myself as a child laying there and waiting in bed and how the anticipation grew, I thought it might be appropriate for us to not have all the decorations up yet. And each week, you might notice that our anticipation for what is coming is going to be growing a little bit each week. Because as we begin to become aware of the presence of God in our lives, our our ability to sense that in different places increases too. Just as our anticipation grows for the coming of Christmas with each day, so our awareness of the presence of God, when we take time to tune into that voice, we begin to hear it more and more, and we begin to see Christ revealing himself in places that we didn't expect. And that anticipation, that experience of the presence of God just increases and overflows. So, let us wake from our sleeping, for now is the time. Our salvation is nearer now than when we became believers. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. So I want to invite you this morning to participate in something this Advent that maybe you've never done before. I've uh, asked Mickey to help me pass out some papers here. So she's going to be passing these out. And what it is, it's called Watching for Christ, a guide to seeing our Savior in the Advent season. And there's a a line for every day of Advent. And here's what I'm going to ask that you would do, just to kind of see if this this is true. I'd like at the end of your day, I'd like you to, Put on that line how it was Christ came to you as you waited, as you lived in expectation and anticipation. How is it that Christ revealed himself to you? It might be through a song you hear on the radio. It might be through a scripture that you read. It might be through a family member. It might be through a hug. It might be through seeing the lights of Christmas all around you and being reminded of the light of Christ, the light that we can now walk in because day has come and night has gone. So I just want you to kind of uh, do this along with me. Watch for Christ. I think that at the end of Advent, you'll become, you'll be surprised at how often Christ visited you. You'll look at this sheet and it will be full and this won't be enough room and you'll have to start another page because you took up too many lines on one day because Christ's presence was so real and overwhelming in your life that one line wasn't enough. You had to have more room to write how Christ was revealing himself. And as, just as we move through this Advent season and uh, our, under, our vision of what is coming is going to increase, so as you go along, I think you'll be seeing Christ more and more. You'll see him in new places that you didn't expect to see him before. And so I want to invite you to, to do this, this Advent, to expect the presence of Christ in your life. And as we become aware of how often it is our Savior is coming to us, not only will we get to know our Christ, not only will we get to have a better understanding of who it is we're waiting for to come in His fullness, but I think that we will be overwhelmed and it will transform us and we'll say, look at how often my Savior is visiting me. Look how often Christ is coming close. Look how often My Lord is coming near. So we don't need to wait. We don't need to wait for his return 
to see Christ coming to us now. We keep awake. We walk in the light of the Lord. For now is the moment for us to wake from our sleep. Our salvation is nearer than when we first became believers. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, the first Sunday of Advent. The first day that we gather together and we're reminded that we're waiting for you to come. Lord, as we wait, teach us how to stay awake. Teach us how to watch for you so that when you come in your fullness, we will recognize you without a moment's hesitation. We'll know exactly what our Savior is like. We'll know exactly who it is we're, we're expecting to see. Lord, as we're faithful to watch for you, I know that you will be faithful to reveal yourself. So Lord, I'm asking that you would show up in unexpected places and that we might become overwhelmed with how often our Lord is coming close to us, how often the Advent season is becoming real in our lives, how often you are incarnating all over again, that you're taking on flesh, that you're speaking to us through one another. Lord, I'm hoping and praying that these sheets will be filled up with names of people in this congregation where we're saying, that person in that pew, that person was the presence of Christ to me today. And I recognize that as Christ coming close to me. And I, I'm overwhelmed with how often my Lord is coming near. And Lord, would you take that, that overwhelming sense of your presence and would you allow it to transform us so that we're no longer living in the night, but that we're living in the day, that we're living in your light. Lord, would you then allow that to really change our character, to change what we're like? Would you help, that, help us to become more like you because of that? Would you take the things that we formerly used as weapons, whether it's our words or our attitude or whatever it is, Lord, would you transform those into things that can sprout up life, that will be tools of bringing new life? Lord, would you change us in your presence? Thank you for revealing yourself to us this morning, in this time. And we wait with anticipation for how it is you will reveal yourself to us throughout this Advent season. In the name of Christ, we pray these things. Amen.